All right, The Truth About Love. That's the title this morning, The Truth About Love. Love, obviously, is a very important attribute in the Christian life. And we know that the first and greatest commandment, Matthew 22, verse 37, is about love. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 1 John 4, look at what this says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And I might have uh, missed copying that one into the slide, but love obviously is an important thing. We're commanded to love, but then you've got to ask yourself the question, well, what is love? Everyone has their own interpretation of what love is and what they think love is. They think love is a feeling. You've got, you know, love is just tolerance of anything, even if it's wickedness and whatnot. So we need a definition of what love is. And we read through 2 John this morning and we actually get a definition of what it means to love somebody. It says here in verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. So that's all great. And sometimes even Christians, you ask them, what is love? And you know, if you say, well, we're meant to love one another, we're meant to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. You say, God is love. That's all sounds good and well. But what does it mean to love? Well, verse 6 tells us, and this is love. Look at this. That we walk after his commandments, this is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. See, so love is just not whatever we want. I and mean, if we go back to Matthew 22, you can see here where Jesus gives the first and second commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. He, he ends in verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you see how he's directing us back to God's word because obeying God's word is how we love. It's not just how we feel. It's not just, oh, it's just this great you know, thing that we do and we can't really put our finger on it, what it is. It's just something that happens. No, love is when we keep God's commandments. That's the truth. Now, why is that important today? Because today, often, keeping God's commandments is called hate, right? They call that hate when you keep God's commandments. I mean, so often, I get so many comments on my sermons, about child rearing, right? When I talk about spanking, and people will say things like, I can't believe you hate your children so much that you'll spank them and you'll you know, abuse them, right? They don't really differentiate between abuse and corporal punishment, right? Loving discipline. But isn't it funny that the Bible says the opposite to what people say? People say, why do you hate your children so much that you discipline them with corporal punishment? But the Bible says the opposite. The Bible says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. You see, so the, the phrase is not if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. The saying is if you spare the rod, you hate the child. That's what the Bible says. But he that loveth him, chasteneth him be times. Be times means early. Why? Because there's a time when spankings don't work anymore, guys. That's why you can't leave it till too late. Because when they're teenagers, you, you spank teenagers, it doesn't have the same effect when you spank toddlers and you spank, you know, younger children, right? In terms of disciplining for all. And obviously, this sermon is not about spanking, but you've got to have love and discipline, right? But what I'm saying here is we need to make sure as believers in God, believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, Bible-believing Christians, that we have the right perspective on love. We don't buy in to the world's philosophy on love, you know, even though they want to define it differently. You know, the whole love wins, and it's like, you know, homosexuality is an abomination to God, but yet they call that love. We want to have the right view on love. Okay, so love is keeping the commandments of God. You love others. 
by keeping the commandments of God. You can't love others when you're breaking the commandments of God. John 14, 15, look what it says here. Jesus said, if ye love me, look what it says, keep my commandments. People will say, well, can't I love God, you know, without having to go to church? Can you? Can you love God when you're not keeping his commandments? The Bible says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Now, you can be saved without having to go to church. But can you say you love God when you don't want to go to church? Or you don't go to church? I don't think so. You know, obviously our love is never perfect, but it's something for us to reflect on. If we love God, do we make the effort to keep God's commandments? That's how we show our love. It's not just, oh, I love God so much, and it's just like, I just get this, oh, I just feel this is like so much love. Because you can have that feeling and be in disobedience. Yeah, that's not love. Right? Love is not just this feeling. Right? Love is you keeping God's command. That, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Now, what I want to also say as well, love is not just keeping the commandments, it's also the attitude you have whilst keeping the commandments. And we've all experienced that with children. You tell them to do something. And, you know, I was telling you, like, my children recently, you know, you tell them to say sorry, and they're like, sorry, you know? So, you know, it's, a, it's not just about keeping the commandments. The attitude is also important, right? So you don't want to just say, well, I'm doing what I have to, and therefore I'm loving God. How you do it also makes a difference too. Look what it says here in 1 John 5. By this we know that we love the children of God, and we love God, look at this, and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, look at this, and his commandments are not grievous. They're not grievous. This is, why, this is when you realize how far short you come from what God expects from you. Because you may be doing stuff, but then do you actually enjoy doing it? Do you actually desire to do it? Is, uh, is reading your Bible uh, like a burden? Like, ah, oh, I've got I've to gotta do my chapter today. Or, ah, oh, I've got to drag myself to church today. I've got to go soul winning again. That's the wrong attitude. That's an attitude of not love, right? Because an attitude of love is you keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. What do I mean? They're not burdensome to you. And this is, this is what I mean by that's where you know when you're getting close, you know, we're not getting close, but you're going in the right direction, right? When you start actually loving to be with God, be with God's people, studying his word, talking about his word, serving God. You, know, you start, your mind starts thinking about how is my life and the things I'm doing with my life contributing to God's ministry. Look at even the psalm we read this morning. Right? When you come and you sing to the Lord, you say, well, I'm singing because I don't want Victor to pull me up if he sees me not singing. Right? That's, not, that's the right attitude. Right? Keeping the commandments. His commandments are not grievous. Psalm 100, look. Make a, what is it? Joyful noise unto the Lord. Is it just make a noise unto the Lord? Some people come to church and they just sing, you know, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice, you know, praise the Lord. You know, oh, I was singing all four verses this morning. Oh, man. Ah, it's like, I thought the three was, I didn't know this song had four verses. Ah, I get too much praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. So your attitude is also included with love. So what is love? Right? Love is keeping God's commandments and keeping them with an attitude, a good attitude, right? An attitude of love as well. Now let's talk about things where people confuse with love. Right? The first one I want to talk about is emotion. Emotion. Now love, I want you to hear me here, love is not just emotion. Because love does include emotion. But what you need to be aware of is you don't want to think just because there's emotion. That's love. Love is not just emotion. But does love include emotion? Yes. Song of Solomon 5. If you've never read Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon is a love letter, you know, between you know, spouses, right? My beloved, put in his hand by the hole of the door. My bowels were moved for him, right? So this is, a, this is a married couple. They're talking about the feelings they have for one another. Nothing wrong with feelings. I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles 
of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed. When he spake, I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me, they wounded me, the keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. And that's not sick, meaning you don't want it anymore. It's like, it's like they're, they're feeling sick because it's like they're so in love, right? So love <coughs> is often emotional. And, you know, that emotion is intensified by intimacy. And this is why it's very important and it's very dangerous for unmarried couples to be intimate. Because not only are they already feeling those emotions, but it's intensified when you are physically doing things that you should not do. So, you know, that's why love is not just emotion. Because people can have emotions for one another, but that doesn't mean they're loving one another. Just like people who fornicate, for example, right? People who do things when they shouldn't. So love puts purpose before emotion. That's why it's not just emotion, because love puts purpose before emotion. Love is not emotion before purpose. That's why with unmarried couples, you know, I often will tell them, hey, you need to discuss philosophy, future plans, religious beliefs, before becoming too emotionally attached, before being physical. So I tell you to unmarried couples, you, know, you should not be spending lots of time together late nights. You know, don't think just because you call yourself boyfriend and girlfriend that it's okay for you to hold hands and hug and sit you know, with your hand on her leg and all the time, and God forbid, go any further than that, right? That is, should not happen because then you now are no longer discussing purpose before emotion. But even likewise, after marriage, right? So before marriage, you know, you want purpose before emotion, but even after marriage, you can apply this too, because, you know, and you can apply these principles. I'm just using a, an example of marriage, but even with marriage, you know, you need to, when we talk about purpose before emotion, you need to continue to nurture that relationship, you know, communicate well with your spouse, serve your spouse, even when the emotions are not there. See, because sometimes, you know, life you know, goes ups and downs, right? Emotions go up and down. And this is why love is consistent, right? Because it's keeping God's commandments. It's not based on emotions. But is emotions included in love? Yes, as we see here in Song of Solomon 5. But look at what it says here in Ephesians 5. This is talking about husband and wife. Therefore, nevertheless, let, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I'm not, not reading the whole chapter of Ephesians 5, but this is talking about the role of husband and wife. You know, the husband is the head of the wife and he loves his wife as Christ loves the church. And the woman, you know, uh, obeys the husband as the church obeys Christ. But what I want to point out here is it doesn't say you love your wife if she reverences you. This is how I think some people understand how this works, right? This is not how marriage works. Marriage is not, I love my wife if she gives me reverence. Right? It is, you love your wife, that's the commandment to you. And to, to wives, you reverence your husband, that's the commandment to you. It's not you reverence your husband if he loves you. Right? Because you can keep, you can love your husband and keep the commandments of God, and it's not conditional upon their response to you. Right? It's conditional upon you obeying God's commandments. So even if the emotion goes, that doesn't mean you shouldn't still love your spouse. Right, Because love is not just emotion. Love can exist without emotion. But can love lead to emotion? Yes. So why is that? Why? Because, go back to Second John, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that if you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So emotion, love is not just emotion. Love is not just giving of gifts. Now, is giving of gifts something that you do when you love somebody? Yes. But love is not just giving gifts. John 3, of course, there is giving in love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
James 1, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But you see, love is not just unbridled giving. You don't want to think just because I'm giving gifts or I'm giving of my time, I'm doing something for somebody, that that's necessarily love. Why? Because love is keeping God's commandments. There are times when God does not give something that people ask for. He refrains from giving. Ye lust and ye have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, verse 3, and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. So sometimes we ask for things from God and we don't get it. Does that mean God doesn't love us? No. Sometimes we, re we refrain from giving because that is the better thing to do. So love gives to be a blessing. But sometimes love, sometimes love needs to deny a request. You know, parents, don't just give children everything they want. You know, we children need to sometimes learn the value of making money, earn things for themselves. Sometimes you need to say, no, you're not going to get it just because Johnny's got it. You know what I mean? Like, that's too bad. You know, you're not Johnny. You know, doing it for you. You know, they, they, they sometimes you need to force them to eat their vegetables. You know, that's why parents, don't be picky eaters. You know, eat things because you don't want your children to be picky eaters. You know, and if your children, you know, every child turns their nose up at things at the beginning. It's just you didn't really take notice of it when they were, you know, not talking or they were toddler, you know, they were babies. But then for some reason, when kids are like five, six, and seven, I always start hearing from parents, oh, he won't eat this, he won't eat that. Hey, your child probably didn't eat anything the first time you gave it. You know, any, anyone ever gave their child a lemon the first time? You know, everyone does that to their child. You know? It's always like that with kids. So just don't forget that when they're older. You know, when they're nine, when they're ten, they're like, oh, I don't want to eat that. Eat it! You know, you will eat it. Right? And you will like it later. Trust me. You know, you won't eat, you won't like it the day you eat it, but you'll like it later. And then my kids are proof of that. You know, you see my kids eating all sorts of stuff. I mean, I was surprised that, like, uh, I had some people over yesterday, and then, like, you know, Timothy, like, poured all this chili sauce on his, on his, uh, on his food. And I was like, I didn't even know you ate chili sauce, you know, because, like, you know, when you're trying to get your kids to eat chili, you know, the first time they eat it, they're in tears, you know what I mean? You know, drinking water and everything. Now they're eating chili sauce, see, and growing up. Doing good, Timothy. It's a man, it's a man's man, eating chili, yeah. So, uh, yeah, why is that, right? So, you know, because this is love. We walk after his commandment. So, you know, you've got to teach your children, work for rewards, be content, be content with the things that they have. And like, it's the same with, uh, you know, in couples as well, when it comes to married people and whatnot, unmarried persons, you know, sometimes spending too much time together isn't always the loving thing to do. Like, I know sometimes unmarried uh, people that are, you know, dating and whatnot, I love them so much, I want to always call them on the phone and I want to go out, oh, I'm happy to pick you up and go here and I just want to give you everything, you know, make money in the week and I just take my, you know, girlfriend out and spend all the money on her, buy her nice things. Is that love? Is that truly love to, you know, to treat somebody you're not married to with that sort of adoration and everything and without purpose, right? So you see, you've got to refrain sometimes from spending the time. Refrain from the intimacy. Refrain from the gift giving. That's the more loving thing until you commit to marriage and then that's how you truly love somebody. Right? So, you know, same with your spouse, right? And you, can, you can spend all this money pleasing them, buying gifts and everything, but it's like you go on holiday and then you've got all these debts to pay. You know, sometimes I don't understand when uh, couples don't see themselves as one purse. You know, it's like Oh, I want to buy this and buy it. And it's like, you, you, you have the one purse. You know, if you spend all this money buying you these nice clothes or whatever, you're going to have less money for rent and less money for a house. And it's likewise for the guys. You know, if the girl goes out and buys him like all this fancy stuff, I mean, you've got to think of your money as one rather than think of your money as it's my money and her money. I don't think that's healthy. I think it's good for uh, a family to be one flesh, right? You're meant to be one flesh, so you should be thinking as one as well. Right, and making decisions to get what's best for the family, not just what you want. Right, so, and think about it. Many people, if love was just giving gifts, I mean, don't, don't a lot of people give gifts without love? Right? Out of obligation? I mean, we just went through Christmas. 
I mean, did you receive gifts that were just out of obligation? Did you give gifts that were just out of obligation <laughs> and, and not really, uh, you know, loving? So that, that just goes to show, like, love is not just giving. And love is, uh, you know, doing what's right for the other person. And love is uh, being a good steward of your resource. Why is that? Because this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Number three, love is not just peace. What I mean by that? The absence of conflict. Love is not just peace. Now, does love lead to peace? Yes, it should lead to peace. True love will lead to peace. Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring, striving, right, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of of peace. But you see here, life is not a fantasy. Conflict is inevitable. Right? So that's why peace is not just an absence of any sort of conflict, because if there's no conflict happening, something's wrong, right? I mean, usually, you know, any people, sinners that get together, there's going to be conflict, right? And, you know, you don't want to just not deal with the conflict. There's peace, but then there's that underlying conflict and friction that's there that's not being resolved. And that actually happens amongst friends, it can happen amongst co-workers, it can happen in families, it can happen in churches, right? Where just because there's peace, that doesn't mean you're necessarily loving the way God wants you to love. 1 Corinthians 13, this famous chapter on love, charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity. So you see there that charity doesn't rejoice in what's wrong. You know? Charity doesn't see somebody getting drunk on Facebook and then like that post, you know, or doing something. Charity doesn't see somebody doing something on a Sunday when they should be in church and like that post. What's going on? Guys, if you know, if you, if you think I'm talking about you, I probably am. <laughs> All right? I see you guys. Facebook, unless you defriend me. All right? <laughs> Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, verse 6, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. This is what I want to focus on in this cha chapter. Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So you see how charity has to bear some things. Has to endure some things because true charity involves conflict resolution. Right? So you don't want to get your expectations about marriage and about children from movies because sometimes they don't tell the true story. They think it's just a bed of roses and you know, once you get married, you walk off into the sunset and they lived happily ever after. But the truth of it is to live happily ever after requires love but not love the way the world defines love, when sometimes, oh, you know, I, I love, I want to keep my family in peace, so I just don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with it. You know, we, uh, we, don't have, we don't go there. That's not love. Love is you need to resolve those conflicts. You need to have unity with, with truth, right? Not just unity. You want peace through unity versus peace through an absence of conflict. Right? So how do you get peace? You should be one mind. You've got to discuss, resolve conflict. Not just peace because you're not dealing with the conflict. There's two types of wisdom in the world. James 3, look at this. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, so conversation in the King James Bible is talking about your lifestyle, right? His works with meekness of wisdom. So usually when the Bible is talking about speaking, it's talking about communication, right? But conversation is talking about your lifestyle in the, in the Bible. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Right? So not all wisdom is godly wisdom. You see, you have bad wisdom that leads to strife, and leads to conflict, and leads to these things. Bitterness, envying, right? This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, devilish. Verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Now here's the good type of wisdom, but the wisdom that is from above. Look at this. Is first pure 
then peaceable. It's first pure, then peaceable. It's first right and then peaceable. Often people will have, they, they think it's peace at all costs. Just don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to, you know, the conflict. No, it's first pure, then peaceable. You do what's right. Now sometimes the loving and the right thing to do is to just let it go for a season. I'm not saying, therefore, you've got to deal with it at that moment every single time. It takes some wisdom, the wisdom. But it's first pure. It's doing what's right. It's not just first peaceable. It's first pure, then peaceable. Gentle and easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So yes, peace is a good thing. But it's not peace at all costs, right? It's peace through unity and truth. And love, true love, not peace through an absence of conflict. That is not love. And this is why repentance and forgiveness is necessary, right, in the Christian life, where you come, you turn from doing what's wrong, and you ask for forgiveness, right? It's, it's going to be a part of your Christian life. You know, if you get some, and you know, I always try and give people the heads up, just even in our church, but in the Christian life, if you think being saved means everyone's like just a saint and there's no conflict anymore and it's like i can't believe like i had expectations for people of the world but people in church how can they do this or they're a christian how can they do this hey this is life this is sinners saved by grace this is not people that are absence of sin you know so we are sinners saved by grace we need to understand that Christians can sin too. And then why would we have passages like this? Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. You see, this is a part of the Christian life. This is like two brethren sinning against each other. Right? It's not necessarily enemies. My brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. So, love is not just an absence of conflict. I mean, it's just like God. I mean, God deals, he resolves our conflict. He came and he tried to resolve the enmity between us and him. He could have just not created us. And then there would have been no conflict. Right? But no, he created us knowing there was a conflict, but yet he showed us how to deal with conflict. He resolved it. Why do we love God? Because he first loved us. Don't ever forget that. You, know, you, don't, you don't earn God's love. You don't deserve God's love. You, we love God in response to the love that God shows us. So you know, why is love not just peace? Because love, this is love, that we walk after his commandments, what's right and what's true first. Then peace. Love can include peace, but love is not just peace. Now let's talk about number four, sexual desire. Sexual desire. Some people think love is just like my lust towards somebody else. Now does love, when it comes to a married couple, does love include sexual desire and sexual gratification? Of course, right? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So you see, that's the negative side. So love is not just physical intimacy, right? Because there's a such thing called fornication, right? Where you have physically intimate with somebody that you are not married to. That is not the loving thing to do. You're not loving that person. So love is you know sexual gratification that is to the benefit of your spouse love is not sexual gratification that is self-serving right and sinful nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband the wife hath not power of her own body but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body but the wife Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So even in marriage, love is not just fulfilling your own sexual gratification. Right? Love is a service that you do for your spouse. 
And that's why, you know, even if you, you know, you don't necessarily have emotions for one another, obviously it's going to make it more difficult, but, you know, if you have a good relationship, you know, this is one way that you show your love towards one another. There's obviously the physical intimacy between husband and wife. But the reason why I'm making this point that love is not just a sexual desire is because in the world, you know, when people think fornication is okay, and they try and tell people, you know, like boyfriends will tell girlfriends, and girlfriends will tell boyfriends, if you love me, you'll let me do this. If you love me, you will do this physical act or that physical act. And that's not true. That's not true. Right? And don't buy into this whole idea as if, oh, if you really care about me, if you really love me, you'll hold my hand. You'll let me hug you. You'll let me touch you there. You'll do this. You'll do that. That's not loving. That's somebody taking advantage of the other person for their own sexual gratification. That's why love, even in marriage, is not about gratifying yourself, right? It is about serving the other person. And girls, you know, like younger girls, yeah, if you're growing, you grow up. I mean, do not give the away the major incentive for a man to commit to you. Right, young girls that are single? You know, like, this is one big incentive to make a guy actually do what's right, and you give it to him for free. You know, my mom would always say, you know, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? This is why, I don't know why girls just want to show it all out. I know you want some attention. This is not the attention you want. You don't want the attention where girl, guys are looking at your breasts and looking at your legs and looking at your butt. That's not the attention you want, right? The attention you want is somebody to focus on your character, right? That's the attention you want. So, you know, you don't want to cheapen yourself by doing that, right? And give away one thing that is very valuable to you, and that's your purity, you know? So, and all, obviously for boys, you know, shame on you if you've ever done that, you know, but when we want to teach our boys not to have to do that, treat their, uh, the girls uh, with purity and uh, as sisters. So, you know, if a boy truly loves you, you know, he'll take the necessary steps to stay pure until he marries you. Otherwise, that's not love. And why is that? Because this is love. We walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Last one. And um, this one you may not have seen coming, but I'll, I'll explain it in a moment. But love is not just service. Love is not just serving another person. Even though love includes serving another person. Galatians 5 verse 13. For brethren... Ye have been called unto liberty, and ye use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So if you remember the first commandment is to love God and then your neighbour, but, you know, this doesn't mean that you just do everything for someone. And I kind of alluded to it when I was talking about giving gifts, you know, refraining from necessarily doing something. Just serving somebody and not doing what's right, you know, just not thinking about what's best for them isn't always the best thing. Um, I think about children that grow up having everything done for them, right? Having all their laundry done for them, you know, they come home and they, you know, they come home and then they just throw their shoes and throw everything, throw their school bag or whatever on the floor. And mom and dad, you just love them so much that you just go up after them. Pick them up. Don't worry, I love them. You know, never get them to help with chores. Never get them to help cook or clean. Never help get them to help clear the table because you love them so much, you want to serve them. Sometimes serving them is not always a loving thing to do. Just because you love somebody, that doesn't mean you just do everything for them. I mean, God doesn't even do everything for us. He gets you to do some things. You have a responsibility. Sometimes we we it's like we pray for things that's your responsibility. You know that? God, help me get out of bed this morning and go look for a job. God, help me go to church. God, help me read my Bible. Yeah, it's like you got to, that's your responsibility. You know, we, usually we pray for things that are outside of our control. We're praying for things that, you know, to help, yeah, we can pray for God to help us with things, obviously, but what I'm, my point is, sometimes we want God to do something 
that's your responsibility, right? And it's like with children. We don't want them growing up realizing they don't have responsibilities and then they grow up and then they, they get like a culture shock when they have to live on their own. They have to deal with things. They have to like, they don't realize like, oh man, I have to do all this to manage a house. I didn't know because my mom did all this for me. You know, my dad did all this for me. You need to make sure that as you raise your children, guys, expose them to responsibility. Get them to do things. People say you are, you know, you're slave labor, making your kids do everything. Yeah. Getting them to do stuff around the house, pull their weight. Amen. Right? So they do. They, they, and, you, and for those of you who've come to my house, you've seen them folding clothes, doing the laundry, taking the rubbish, you've seen them vacuuming, stuff like that. They can do it. And um, just like I expect them to sit at, you know, obviously they're not perfect, but you know, I expect them to sit at the table and eat and do things respectfully. I expect them to do things properly too. You know, like, so you say, like, don't, this is where, like, I, I sort of talk about sometimes raising the standard for your children, guys, is, you know, when they're doing things, if you tell them to vacuum the floor, I'm talking about older kids, right? If you have to tell them to vacuum the floor or you tell them to, like, fold the clothes and they don't do a good job, pull them up on it. You know, it's better that they learn that responsibility from you than they go and be a terrible employee. You're going to set them up for success for life if you, if you teach them to be diligent, right? So don't get this mentality that it's just, ah, oh, you know, you're so, just making it, you're so high standard. So, yeah, yeah, you, you have to be like that so that, you know, you, you train your children to have high standards because if you just do everything for them, they're going to struggle a bit when they get their first job. So you just, you just you know, obviously it's not something they can't learn later, but you're going to set them up for success, you know, rather than setting them up for failure. So love does what is right, not what is convenient. Sometimes it's easier to just put your kids' shoes back on the shelf. And it's harder to go find them and go, you, go pick up your shoes, put it on the shelf, and then they just throw them in there. Hey! Take them out, you know, put them properly, put them neatly, you know, just, yeah, you've got a shelf for all your shoes, but I don't want it just dumped all in there. Do you know what I mean? I want you to be neat and tidy, right? So, you, love does what's right, not just what's convenient, right? Look here, 2 Thessalonians 3. For even when we were with you, with this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy." but admonish him as a brother. So you see how this is done with love. But this is refraining from giving somebody something, not serving somebody. People get this idea that, you know, church is just like where they can get free money, where they can get free food. They just come, just take advantage of God's people. No. The Bible says here, if somebody's just coming and just like taking advantage of everyone and they're a bum, they're lazy, they are able-bodied and able to work, we do something about it, right? We don't. He says, you, any would not work, verse 10, neither should he eat, right? So you can't just come as a lazy person and not doing anything about work and you never have any money and then you're just mooching off God's people. And God, people don't want this mindset. that we just, oh, we just keep serving because love would be, you admonish him as a brother and say, look, you've got to work. And if you're not going to work, we're not going to just keep providing for you. You know, we're not just going to keep going away. Obviously, there's some grace there, but, you know, all I'm saying is it's not unbridled service, right? So you want to be a good example to your family, right? So some people, like I talked about to the children, it's the same as parents. Anyone that's got responsibility, you know, you serve, you want to serve them so much, so you're always spending time with them. But if you are neglecting God's will, to serve your family. That's not the love either that God wants us to have. So making family plans and family dates where you skip church and whatnot, you're not putting God first, that's not loving your family just because you're serving them. You're doing something for them, right? You have to love God first. Love always serves God first. And why is that? Because this is love. 
that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you've heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So, in conclusion, you know, whilst love includes many factors, right, the overriding principle is that love is keeping God's commandments. So, whilst love can include emotion and service and all the things we talked about, never get this idea that that is what love is, right? Love must be understood, or those things must be understood in light of true love, and love is when you keep God's commandments. So, if you internalize this, if you understand this truth that I'm preaching to you today, then that will help you discern between what love is and what love isn't when you go about trying to keep the first and great commandment and the second commandment. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that you gave us the perfect example of love. And help us, Lord, to follow that example. Give us the grace we need to do it. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to discern between what is love and what isn't. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.